Before I get started, I would like to thank very much the organizers for putting this together, for making liver disease important in Africa. And um, I want to thank you also, because at the time they started talking about CODA, I was working in Lagos, Nigeria, in hepatology. In the past nine months, I've been coordinating viral hepatitis for the Africa region, for the World Health Organization. And so my presentation will be from a WHO perspective and the implications of all of this research and science that we have done to the regional community. So the outline is as shown and is about the WHO global strategy for elimination of viral hepatitis. But before I go into that, I just want to talk about real life and practice as a hepatologist. And this gentleman is a 42-year-old man who we saw in our hepatology clinic in Nigeria. And when he was diagnosed as having liver cancer, of course, our first African thought is to reject it, not so. <laughs> so he did not like our diagnosis. He had never heard of viral hepatitis. It was viral hepatitis B induced cirrhosis. So he defaulted for the clinic for about six months. And when he came back six months later, I was so intrigued to see all these marks on his abdomen. The marks were not there when we saw him six months earlier. And I asked about the marks, and he said that, well, he had gone to a traditional healer. And of course, what the traditional healer would do is to use a sharp blade and make scarification marks to remove bad blood. So he had gone the native way, and all the bad blood had been removed. But when the mass continued to grow, he came back to the clinic. And so, HCC is real. I've seen several thousands of hepatitis, cirrhosis, several thousands of liver cancer, as some of my colleagues have seen here. So it is with great joy that I see a global movement towards the elimination of viral hepatitis in our region. So it's a death toll we can no longer neglect. And it's a real death toll with the mortality, as you are seeing it in Africa, the blue is hepatitis B. So we have a significant issue with hepatitis B in our environment and also a lot in Southeast Asia. What proportion of liver cancer is due to hepatitis B or C? Quite a lot. If you look in the Western Pacific, in the European, African, American populations, it is significant in the Western Pacific and in the African population, where hepatitis B accounts for nearly more than 50% of liver cancers. We have been told about the prevalence, but I always like this because it gives a very visual feel that second to the Western Pacific region, Africa region has the highest concentration of hepatitis B. There are 60 million hepatitis B infected persons in Africa, and about 5 million of them are children under the age of 5 years. The cumulative incidence of chronic infections have reduced worldwide because of the onset of vaccination. But in our continent, we're still looking at about 3% of our children under five still have hepatitis B. So there's something failing that we still have such a high prevalence in children under five years, 40 years after the hepatitis B vaccine was discovered. 
in terms of hepatitis C, hepatitis C is a bit more homogeneous. Africa region comes fifth here with about 10 to 11 million hepatitis C infections. And has been said in previous studies, globally, when you hear hepatitis C, you think of IV drug use. So in many of the places we go to as WHO, you hear HCV, you think IVU. But in Africa, most of the hepatitis C is not from injecting drug users, but it's from unsafe injections, both in health facilities and outside health facilities. And the global health sector strategy is a roadmap to elimination. It is the goal of this, um, this is to eliminate viral hepatitis as a major public health threat by the year 2030. That is in 12 to 13 years from now. And my question to you is that, is it possible to do this? Is it possible to eliminate viral hepatitis as a public health threat? Um, and the answer will be maybe or yes or no. I'm not sure what the participants think. But we have opportunities now to build on a mandate to monitor progress in the context of universal health coverage. At this point in time, there is an unprecedented momentum caused by the new medicines for hepatitis C cure, caused by effective therapy for hepatitis B, and already we have leadership in promoting this agenda from Rwanda, is an African country, and from other countries like Brazil and Georgia, Mongolia, and certainly Egypt, that has taken leadership in hepatitis C on our continent. There's also the issue of the public health infrastructure and model from the HIV response. The HIV response has progressed remarkably on our continent and has set up infrastructure for care. Is there a role for managing hepatitis B and C or C on the infrastructure built by HIV? So the essence of a strategy is that strategy and targets lead to national plans. And we need countries in the region to rise up as a coordinated response. And what WHO is proposing and promoting is for each country to have what is called a regional action framework that stems from this global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis. So the development of these plans make it mandatory that we agree on common targets for joint accountability and is also a powerful tool for mobilizing resources and mobilizing action. In the past eight years, we've come a long way from viral hepatitis. From the first WHO resolution in 2010 to the second WHO resolution and to the various World Hepatitis Summit, there has been a five-fold increase in advocacy for viral hepatitis. And to date, we have about 82 countries that have a hepatitis national strategic plan. There are about 20 countries in Africa now with that plan, and we're working towards consolidating and coordinating hepatitis control. What are the targets? What do we want to accomplish by 20? 30. And one of them is about prevention. Is it possible to reduce new infections from 10 million in 2015 by 30% in 2020, which is two years ago away, and to have a 90% reduction by 2030? Those are our inspirational goals. 
we want to reduce the deaths. We have agreed to reduce the deaths from viral hepatitis by 10% by the year 2020 and by 65% by the year 2030, which translates to new infections less than 900,000 per year by 2030 and the 1.34 million deaths seen in 2015 and similar throughout the years should be reduced to less than 500,000 deaths by 2030. So that is the goal. Now the question is how do we reach these goals? And modeling studies have suggested that five core interventions with sufficient coverage will take us to accomplish the impact in 2030. And these five interventions, you know them already, but one is three dose hepatitis B vaccine to a level of 90% worldwide. Number two is hepatitis B prevention of mother to child transmission, which was mentioned, to take that to 90% by 2030. We talked about blood and injection safety. We need to have 100% screened donations. The first speaker talked about the lack of proper screening. And one of the other speakers talked about the donations of blood in blood banking services and the absence of NAT testing in many of our blood banks. Many of our blood banks would use ELISA technology to screen for blood. So there is an avenue for continuing infection. In terms of harm reductions, especially in regions of the world where IV drug use is important, there is a set target for needle exchange sets for people who inject drugs. The challenge for us now is now on testing and treatment. And the target is that 90% of people with hepatitis B and C should be diagnosed before the year 2030, and 80% of those eligible for treatment should be on treatment. So the assumptions are three, that prevention will be scaled up, continuing immunization, and innovation in approaches to eliminate mother-to-child transmission, e.g. birth dose. The birth dose is being applied in nine countries of our 47 countries in the Africa region. And the need to scale up blood and injection safety and harm reduction. Harm reduction is important. There are certain hotspots in Africa where there's a lot of PWIDs and nobody should be left behind. So we need to remember PWIDs in our fight against viral hepatitis. Strengthening treatment access towards universal access by 2030. I can tell you that in most countries in Africa now, viral hepatitis is managed in tertiary care. It's managed at the referral centers by experts in viral hepatitis. With a population of 60 million to address, the experts on ground will not be able to rise to the challenge of our elimination targets by 2030. So we have to have innovations in diagnosis, innovation in points of care testing, and innovations in new case findings. One of the barriers is the treatment cost. We know how much DAA's cost, we know how much Tenofova costs, and that cost is too high for most of our countries. Strengthening linkages of hepatitis intervention. The question they of, we often ask is, should the world build a parallel hepatitis treatment program as it has done an HIV treatment program? Does that mean that whenever a new disease comes, we build a parallel program? So there, there, there are 
There are now interventions looking to see how healthcare can be more integrated to reach the entire population of people that need these services. So where are we now in terms of the five key areas? As you can see, HBV vaccination, which is in blue, I'm not sure where the pointer is. In blue, the first row, right, right here, blue, we've done very well with HBV vaccination. We are almost at 80% globally, nearly 70% in the Africa region. We've done well in blood safety, especially in official recognized blood banking system. And we've done quite well in injection safety. But there are huge gaps in preventing mother-to-child transmission, which is possibly what will get us to 100% for prevention. We have not done very well with harm reduction, but the major gaps are here. The major gaps are in hepatitis B diagnosis and hepatitis C diagnosis. And there's a huge gap in hepatitis B treatment and hepatitis C treatment. And part of the gaps in Africa is really lack of data to formulate where we are at this point. So there are five strategies for getting us from 2015 to 2030. And the first is information for focused action. It's the who. Who are the people with hepatitis B or C? What is the epidemiology of viral hepatitis in each country in Africa? Where are they? Where is the data? Where is our surveillance? We need that. The interventions for impact, we have discussed five of them. Now, how do we deliver for equity? How do we get to the rural poor? How do we get to the urban poor? How do we get to the population that do not access tertiary care for treatment? Where does the financing come from? How many countries have insurance? Are they all going to be projects? And innovation for acceleration, the future, how do we scale up? What are the innovations that are necessary to get hepatitis B and C on a public health agenda? And there's a lot to be learned from HIV. Between 20, 2003 to 2012, 9.7 million HIV persons were treated. And what has brought this include price redu reductions, major investments, and new service delivery. Between 2012 and 2015, another 19.5 million were treated for HIV. So are there lessons that we need to learn from the HIV progress that we can apply to hepatitis B and C? Public health approach. Hepatitis has always been a specialty care approach. And part of the goals of reaching millions before 2030 is to consider a public health approach to consider simple diagnosis and case management algorithms. This morning, we talked about hepatitis C and B. I heard about genotypes. We heard about hepatitis B genotypes. How can we reduce the management algorithm to get most people on board? How do we reduce the costs? There's been a strong focus on key and vulnerable populations, absolutely important. But in our part of the world, in Africa, the poor people, both in the rural and urban areas, really are because they do not have access to care. How do we promote service delivery? In HIV, decentralization worked, task shifting worked, Taking HIV to a primary care world. So my question to you, is it possible to take hepatitis B care and C care to the primary level so that the gains of HIV can also be, can, so that hepatitis B and C can also benefit from the processes of HIV? HIV builds strong community systems 
they engaged the communities, they increased advocacy and ad awareness. And it becomes very important as we propose and promote a public health approach in viral hepatitis to also reach the communities and engage with them. How do we transition from an externally funded program to domestic funding? Now with reduction in the HIV funding, they're looking for ways to make HIV a more domestic disease. So how do we make HIV domestic? How do we make hepatitis B also domestic? What is the global response so far? What are the gaps we have reached in achieving these targets? We've talked about immunization. Before 2000, high prevalence in children. After 2015, at the onset of the pentavalent vaccination, there has been a significant decline in hepatitis B in children. The three-dose hepatitis B vaccine was a major advancement with 84% coverage. But as you will see from the various regions of the world, the Africa region remains the place of lowest coverage. So there's a need to strengthen this coverage in sub-Saharan Africa. The birth dose has, has improved in Western Pacific and even in the Americas, but here in Afro, the birth dose again has seen the area of least uptake. In terms of harm reductions, we're still far away from the goal. And the average per year is 27 syringe per needle set per person with who inject drugs per year. The goal is to get to 300. Injection safety has also improved significantly. The proportion of unsafe injections in official facilities has declined significantly. In terms of the cascade of care, this is where the big testing gap is. Out of the 257 million infected hepatitis B persons, only a fraction of this population have been diagnosed, which leaves us with a huge testing gaps, gap. In terms of Africa, we have the biggest gap because we have the least number of diagnosed. And practically only three out of every 1,000 Africans have been tested for hepatitis B. The proportion on treatment is minimal and even unknown for lack of data. The proportion suppressed, there is no data for Africa. So there is a lot of work to be done in getting hepatitis up to scale on a regional level. In terms of hepatitis C, there's actually more been done in hepatitis C. This is the global burden of 70 million, and this is the group of people diagnosed. Six out of every 100 people have been diagnosed. There is, however, still a testing gap, as we see in the gray area for hepatitis C. In terms of started on treatment from the various regions, there remains a big gap on getting people into care or getting people cured and getting the data to show that. About 3 million people as of 2017 have been treated for hepatitis C. What about the treatment? As we've seen, most persons with HBV infection, they live in low-income areas, middle-income areas, and there is hope of the generic medications. It's been estimated that Tenofovir will cost $30,000 per year. But what we've seen in many of the programs here in Africa is Tenofovir resides in the HIV program. And the HIV program is reluctant to have mono-infected people have the Tenofovir. So there is need to ensure access to appropriate treatment for 
HBV monoinfected. Few countries have a hepatitis program. There's fragmented procurement, which of course leads to very high prices. And I think one of the major, one of the countries in Africa that has made a major progress, of course we know is Rwanda. Because Rwanda has fully embraced treatment of hepatitis B and C at the primary care level. And I know that later today or tomorrow, we shall be listening to the experience from Rwanda. Other countries can now buy generics because the patents have expired. Prices for DAAs. I remember that in Nigeria, when DAAs first came, they were 24,000 US dollar for 12 to 24 months, and it was injectables. There was nobody that could afford it. But now with the generics, intensifying competition to reduce price is important. And with the price as low as $200 per cure of hepatitis C, hepatitis C certainly has become reachable and affordable to the people on our continent. So all of those in green have access to generic HCV drugs, and they, have, they can have access to this $200 per cure. So what has WHO done? What actions has the organization done to support countries? Convening is important. The global strategy, the shared targets, they also have a mandate to monitor progress, and I'll talk about that very shortly. Advocacy is key. Global advocacy was conducted, and there has been World Hepatitis Summits. There has been regional conferences. But there is not enough advocacy being done in Africa. There are not many governments that have actually put down domestic funding or financing for viral hepatitis. The normative and the policy work of WHO certainly supports the, the rollout of testing and treatment programs. WHO reports prices. It conducts pre-qualifications and actually evaluates the landscape for patents. And one of the important things they have we've done is to position the hepatitis response not as a specialist care anymore, but within the universal health coverage. Therefore, people who are asymptomatic will have access to a health care near them where they can be tested for hepatitis B and C or B or C and where they can receive evaluation for treatment. Some specific challenges. One of them is information for focused action. There's a need to monitor and document. And now there's a WHO reporting portal trying to build surveillance globally for viral hepatitis so that we can measure our progress towards 2030. There's currently low testing and treatment coverage, so the prevention gap remains. A few weeks ago, we visited Uganda, and Uganda is a country that has tested 2.3 million people in their hepatitis strategy. They did a general population screening of areas of high prevalence in the northern part of the country, and they identified over 200,000 hepatitis B positive individuals. Now the challenge is providing support services and care for these patients. One of the challenges they have found is that there, there are standalone hepatitis clinics without the backup of counseling and testing, of data managers, of electronic recording that has been perfected for HIV. So there's a move to see how integration can occur to use the st structures available from the HIV program to hepatitis? How do we deliver for equity? How do we reach vulnerable groups? How do we reach urban poor, rural poor? How do we finance? 
now there's a cost-effective calculator and they look, we're looking at investment plans, investment strategies for managing viral hepatitis. Innovations are important. We know how expensive hepatitis B viral load is, how expensive hepatitis C viral load is. So how do we get cheaper diagnostics? Because now for hepatitis B and even for C, these are important bottlenecks in advancing care for viral hepatitis. At the global level and at the regional level and at the country level, we're working on collaborating with partners and with ministries of health to build data systems that will capture patient data in healthcare facilities and organize data transmission for analysis and use to improve the program. And the approach will be an incremental approach because prevention indicators already have been monitored. Number of infants vaccinated, healthcare facility, injection safety, these have been monitored, but there is nothing on ground for testing and treatment monitoring. The new updated HCV guidelines promote simpler criteria to start HCV treatment. It's now treat all. It's test and treat all. Simpler treatments to cure all subtypes, as has been discussed this morning, that is pangenotypic. A streamlined approach to procurement from regional levels or country levels that will certainly bring down costs. And then looking at decentralized care, all care should not really be at the tertiary referral centers. They can come down to district levels, integrating service delivery models to reach high coverage. Um, these are some of the examples of simplified testing and treatment algorithms for both hepatitis B and hepatitis C. There is already a WHO-defined package of nine interventions for people who inject drugs, and this includes country support to include PWIDs in the national policies, and all the barriers to IVU, to, and the stigma and the roadblocks to people in prison, people who use drugs, need to be removed in the package of interventions. And these can be promoted and scaled up. This is the hepatitis C calculator, which is already online, which will rapidly do an economic analysis to inform financing decisions and cost effectiveness of care. And there are various partners like Unitaid projects to fast track introduction of innovative solutions and diagnostic mechanisms. I think I'm running out of time, but universal health coverage is, is the health care of the future. Ensuring that hepatitis services, both prevention, testing, and treatment are included in the broader health agenda so that everyone has access irrespective of their socioeconomic grading, will have access to hepatitis B and C care. So in summary, the global health sector strategy for hepatitis control is an ambitious strategy endorsed for elimination with the goals as discussed. Some key areas include birth dose in Africa and globally harm reduction, major testing gaps call for rapid innovations, and medicine prices offer opportunities to promote a public health approach. So the focus of WHO is focusing on delivering for country impact and using research to shape country impact. And universal health care coverage will provide the opportunity for the health for all. Um, before we stop, I would like to just mention this monkey, which was very intriguing in 2013, 
and it was the logo used for World Hepatitis Day in 2013. It was interesting because it shows three wise monkeys, one who hears no evil, one who sees no evil, one who speaks no evil. And this sort of depicts when one ignores a disease. So viral hepatitis, both B and C, have been ignored for such a long time. But in the past five years, I think great advances have been made. And like the previous speaker wrote on his slide, there's still a long way to go. And I think that, I know that one of the ways of getting there is for both academia and policymaker and researchers and patient groups and various other stakeholders in the hepatitis advance. When they work together, then we will be able to reach the elimination targets by 2030. I thank you very much for, for listening.